Hello, everybody, and welcome to Learning Data Live 2019. I'm Alan Pringle of Scriptorium, and I will be moderating this session today. This session is seven data words you can't say to executives by my colleagues slash partners in crime, Sarah O'Keefe and Bill Swallow. Learning Data Live is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you are trying to figure out how the data model can best support your content, or you are trying to set up a data system, please contact us. We would love to work with you. LearningData.com and Learning Data Live would not be possible without the help from our sponsors. I want to tell you a little bit about how this session is going to work. Attendees will be muted during the webcast. Even so, we still want your input during the session. Please type your questions and your comments at any time during the session in the questions module, and our speakers will answer those questions at the end of the session. So if you would now take a little time to find the questions module in the GoToWebinar interface. At the beginning of the question and answer phase, we will drop a link to a session evaluation survey in the questions module, and we very much appreciate your feedback on those sessions. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Bill and Sarah. Are you two there? I am here. All right. Against my so. better judgment, I'm going to give you control <laughs> of this presentation because I'm concerned about what might happen. I don't have a delay for bad things on this end, unfortunately, like they do on television. <laughs> but here we go. Bill, Alan knows us really, really, really well. A little too well. I do. <laughs> a little too well. So, yeah, we're going to talk today about the seven ditto words that you can't say to executives. And uh, the, the idea here was that what we've realized is that when you're uh, talking to your executives, your C-level type people, the people with the money who are gonna fund your data project potentially, you have to talk to them a little bit differently than you talk to your uh, coworkers, your fellow technical writers, your fellow content nerds like us. Um, the executives are interested in some other things other than uh, cool data stuff. So that's what we wanted to focus on today. So my name is Sarah O'Keefe. I'm the CEO and founder here. Um, we are in the business of designing and building content systems, and we are technology agnostic. So I'm particularly interested in how you combine content and technology. And I'm Bill Swallow. Uh, I am the Director of Operations here. I've been with Scriptorium uh, officially a little over five years, uh, although I, <laughs> Sarah and Helen like and I forever. go way back. I know, we go way back. Um, and I'm more interested in how, um, yeah, how we make managing uh, content a lot easier. And I also focus uh, heavily on localization. Uh, I do have some, some hefty <laughs> history in localization. So before we jump into the seven data words that you can't say to executives, um, it's important to know what executives care about, as Sarah mentioned. And you know, we have a lot of experience of uh, working with various different companies and pitching data projects to C-level people. Um, so, well, I guess I'll cut to the chase and ask Sarah, what do executives like? Well, I have bad news because uh, what executives like turns out to be not technology. Uh, and this is hard because, I mean, I love the technology. I love all those inner workings of DITA and all the other weird stuff, but it turns out this doesn't actually appeal to executives. Uh, what does work for executives is something completely different. Yeah, yeah, they, they like the money. Show them the money. <laughs> um, you know, that means that, you know, your focus really needs to be on um, 
the more financial aspect of why you're implementing data. You have to focus on cost savings in content production. Uh, you need to focus on, you know, expediting content development, efficiency in translation and localization, uh, and that whole ROI model and showing the value for what it is that you're proposing that the company invest in. Um, you know, you need to show that value and focus on the cost avoidance, increased revenue through, uh, I don't know, expedited content, more languages, what have you, and better quality content. Right. And there are some other aspects to this. I mean, we do have clients who care about things like compliance. Um, of course, compliance basically means following the rules that the government or other regulatory body has set down for you, because if you do not follow those rules, uh, you don't get to sell your product or your service, which means you get no money. Right. So compliance in the end comes down to I want to be present in the market with my product, which means money. Uh, market share. Well, <laughs> increased market share means increased revenue, which means more money. And user experience is the same way. You can draw a line from user experience to happier customers to more money. Now, you'll notice that one item that's missing here is quality. And I think it's fair to say that there are a few organizations that see quality uh, as a competitive advantage, which in turn leads to market share and more money. But in general, um, quality is one of those, it needs to be good enough. We need to produce something that is good enough to compete in the marketplace, but anything above and beyond good enough for the most part is considered wasted effort. So I'm afraid I have a, a uh, fairly sad and cynical view of the quality argument. <laughs> so how do we step out of our ditto world, you know, into the world of executives, people with money, people with funding, right? Because what this is really about is how are we going to get funding to make these things happen that we think are important. Now, a long, long time ago, I worked in a company that had sort of an executive wing in the office building, and the executive wing had much nicer carpet than the rest of the office. Um, and so, of course, we referred to the C-level executives as the purple carpet people. <laughs> so the question for this presentation is, how do you talk to the purple carpet people? So the first thing I think that you should try to avoid is anything, any kind of new acronym, uh, but especially CCMS. Um, you know, this is this is kind of a bad way to kind of start a needs discussion with your your C levels, uh, and we don't like to use the term CCMS unless, unless they're already familiar with the term. Uh, many executives are familiar with content management systems or CMSs, so it's probably best to to kind of keep the discussion around that terminology. Um, but, you know, we're just complicating things if we start saying, you know, we need this special kind of, of CCMS because the executives just hear, hey, we need to spend a lot of money on a special thing. And every department and every employee, you know, they, we all have special things that we'd love to be able to spend money on. And people are constantly hounding uh, the sea level for funding for a lot of these pet projects, whether or not they're truly pet or not. Uh, so it's important to make sure that you don't come off uh, as saying, hey, we need this new toy. You know, we need this special thing. You know, so it, it's really got to be, you got to poise your ask in terms of, uh, you know, your business requirements, in terms of, you know, what benefits you're going to get. Uh, and not just in terms of, you know, hey, we need this new toy. It looks pretty cool. It's going to make us, you know, allow us to do some pretty fun stuff. Uh, instead, focus on the, what the system can do. And really, that revolves around, you know, getting a system that really understands the technology that you are trying to employ in your content development process. Uh, one that is built for that purpose. Um, you know, it fits all of your requirements and it really maximizes that ROI of implementing a DITA system. And with the ROI, that's really the area you need to focus in for that hard sell uh, to the executives. You know, the ROI could be in uh, reduced localization costs, faster time to market, additional output formats, additional languages, uh, personalized content. But when you're talking in terms of ROI, you have to make sure that anything that you pitch 
you need to be able to measure once you have it implemented. Right. And to be very clear, we're not suggesting that you should not buy a CCMS. We're just suggesting that you should not use the phrase CCMS when you're attempting to sell it to an executive who's going to pay for it. Exactly. So the second ditto word is that should be banned is, is CONREF. And, and of course, we love our CONREFs and we're going to use them and they are fantastic. And they are key data features and they are important, <laughs> key, sorry, I said key, that comes later. They are important data features that we need and that we're going to use. But CONREFs, I mean, they only barely make sense to people that are using data, right? I mean, unless you're pretty well embroiled in data, they are just, they're not gonna make sense to anybody. So we can't talk about CONREFs and we can't talk about CONREF content. And if you start talking about transclusion, they're probably going to kick you out of the meeting. So the problem with this is that as you start talking about CONREFs, I mean, they just, they don't hear a thing anymore, right? They just, they stop listening and all they see is a kaleidoscope of hell. So instead of talking about CONREFs, what can we talk about instead? And some of these are sort of less technical alternatives, and then we can talk a little bit about what that means from a funding point of view. So instead of CONREF, single source of truth. Um, I already heard this once this morning, or maybe it was yesterday, but single source of truth means we capture information in one place, and that one place is the single source of that bit of information. We never ever copy and paste, we just create it once, use it everywhere. We eliminate content duplication. We reduce the total number of pages that we're managing because clearly if you have one page and you copy it 10 times, now you have 11 pages. But if you have one page and you reuse it 10 times, you still have one page and 10 links. So reuse instead of copying, reduce the overall load. And I think Executives do very clearly, along with everybody else, understand that having multiple copies of the same thing is bad. Um, and the shorthand, the sort of corporate shorthand for that these days is single source of truth. It's not my very favorite phrase, but it seems to work. Mm -hmm. So reusing content means efficiency gains. That means less money, less money spent, cost avoidance. Single source of truth improves accuracy. That means better compliance, better ROI, you know, higher quality, but we've already talked about how nobody cares about that. So what you have to do is, is translate single source of truth into money, right? Reuse equals efficiency, single source equals accuracy. Accuracy and efficiency are going to be multiplied for every language version. Every time you translate, you um, recapture that efficiency for another language. So yeah. you have a, it's not exponential, right? But it is a multiplier. Yeah, if you localize content, that's that's really the bang for the buck that you're looking for. Yeah, so CONREF bad, single source of truth, good. What else we got? <laughs> well, Sarah stole my thunder on this one, but uh, oh, key. sorry. Um, Keys are super cool and very useful in DITA. Um, but once you start talking about keys, it's really difficult to boil this you know, concept down for someone who barely understands um, or wants to understand the nuts and bolts of how content is developed and delivered in a structured format, let alone any format. You know, but we're talking about link abstraction, indirect addressing. Once you start talking about this, um, you know, you've lost their interest and uh, you don't want to go there because if you do go there your career might just go there um, you know it's, it's not to say that it's all doom and gloom but um, you know you're going to completely lose uh, your audience once you start talking about keys and you know indirect addressing and all this other fun stuff uh, that you know we as content geeks get into so I recommend just you know avoid this discussion entirely. Um, and if you absolutely have to go down this rabbit hole uh, to kind of explain um, what it is you want to do with keys, uh, just explain that you know it's it's a useful feature um, for managing tricky content variants. You know if you have many different versions of the same product, for example, you know explain that you'll be able to you know easily switch content in and out. Um, 
based on you know different models of the same type of product um, you know instead of rewriting everything from scratch you can just quickly you know flip in and out change your screenshots change you know little things and um, you know it's a push button efficiency um, you know executives like you know the whole push button concept you know say that hey we can simplify things and we can get it down and we can publish many different versions just by swapping things in and out you know very very simply very very quickly but getting into the nuts and bolts of how keys work that is not where you want to go now as, as bill said if, if you go there you've you've pretty much lost um nobody likes to be felt to be made to feel stupid mm -hmm. and if you i mean i've had people explain keys to me they make me feel stupid it's just yeah. not good I even feel stupid um, trying to explain it to other people. <laughs> yeah, I, well, there, there's that. But so notice that we carefully went with, you know, stuff. It does stuff. Yes. All right, style sheet. Um, the word style sheet is problematic. So, uh, you know, we all know that style sheet means you can turn data content into output like HTML and PDF. And we use words like transform or plugin or, you know, XSLT or, you know, various other things. Um, the problem with this one is, is less of a technical problem and more of an expectation problem. Because when you start saying style sheet, now uh, a lot of executives do have some basic familiarity with things like HTML and CSS. And so when you say style sheet, they say, but we already have a CSS. Mm -hmm. you know, how hard could it be? Why are you talking about style sheets as though they are the be all end all when we've had them since 19. So did a style sheets or, you know, style sheets XSLT in the context of did a transformation are not just CSS, but you're going to lose that argument because what you're actually saying is, hey, there's this way to make HTML output and again they're not impressed because you know the idea that our system can make output is is actually not a winning argument and mm -hmm. when they see the default data output which i would strongly advise that you never ever ever show anybody um they're definitely not impressed right they're going to be horrified they're going to look at it and say what is this i mean this is a huge step backwards it doesn't look anything like what we have it doesn't look like our branding it doesn't you know all this stuff so style sheets are problematic because you're trying to uh, convince people to move into an environment that is different from what they're used to uh it you know you've got the whole formatting automation and some of those things and they are just not accustomed to that at all so you're essentially speaking a foreign language and shifting expectations mm -hmm. so instead of talking about style sheet uh, you can talk generically about publishing workflows or output templates. Uh, automation is a really good word because everybody knows that automation is code for cheap and fast. Uh, extensibility is nice. So to be able to say we can generate output and it's extensible for lots of languages and it'll be really efficient and really automated. Um, if you have to pick two here, I'd pick automation and, and efficiency because from an executive point of view, what they're going to hear is uh, faster, less money. And that's really the message that you want to convey, which, you know, is true, right? You are going to speed things up. Now, in order to speed things up, you have to make the argument that data content is format free, and then we're going to add on formatting. Now, that's a fantastic feature, but it's a change in expectations, right? Because your executive in, unless you're in a you know a smaller kind of techie company, executives in general are going to be pretty familiar with you know the hell that is Microsoft Word, and they know that fixing auto numbering is is a real pain or getting tables formatted is a real pain. And so when you try to sell them on format free and we're going to add formatting later, um, that's compelling in that it fixes all these formatting problems, but it's scary in that well, but how do I control the formatting, right? And we get this not just from executives, but from you know, your generic content creators who are pretty upset when you tell them things like, we're taking away your page breaks, or we're taking away your beloved ability to set line breaks or something like that. So 
when you translate style sheet, it looks like a minor term, but what you're really trying to say is, we are going to strip off the formatting, put it in a separate layer, automate, standardize, and as a bonus, eliminate you know something like 50% of the writer effort. Um, and of course, that number depends greatly on your current uh, setup and how things are and how good the templates are. But there is some research out there that says that writers in the uh, in the generic sort of word-based formatting environment spend something like 50% of their time doing formatting as yep. opposed to writing content. Yeah, this gets multiplied if you start looking at it from a localization point of view because a lot of times when you send things out for translation, there is a surcharge or a percentage on the project that's charged for reformatting the translated content to look like the original. And if you're able to use data transformations or style sheets instead of having the translators uh, reformat their translation to match what the original looked like, you're saving a boatload of money right off the bat on your translation costs. And it speeds things up as well, right? Big time. You're, you're talking, yeah. you know, I, I can't, I won't throw out exact numbers, but I mean, you're shaving off a, a ton of time because you're not, you know, you're not hand tweaking every single language to make it look and fit on the page just right. Well, I'll, I'll throw out some numbers from a project we did a while, a while back. Uh, we had a client who had something like a six to nine month delay on producing localized content. So they produce a product in the United States with English content and then had to wait six to nine months before they were able to then sell that product in other countries because they were waiting for the Brazilian Portuguese or the German or the Russian or the whatever to become available. And they could not sell the product without the translation. Well, if you do the math, um, if you assume uh, that you have something like a billion dollars in non-English, non-US revenue per year, and then you, you know, you work through some of the math, but you say that, you know, the, the value, so you're selling $100 million a month, give or take, math is not my thing, and then you assume that your the time value of money is something like 1%. That means that for every month that you lop off that six to nine months, you get $100 million that much sooner, which is basically worth about a million dollars in um, getting the revenue sooner. Now, these are very rough numbers, and if there are any you know, CPAs or CFOs on this call, I am so sorry, but <laughs> you kind of get the idea, right? That if they can go from six months to four months, they're getting $2 million, which will fund a pretty decent did up project. Mm -hmm. So the more local is, and this does not, in fact, take into account the cost savings from the formatting bill that you were talking about, right? This is right. just getting the content in local language sooner. Yep. So if you're a, you know, a decent sized company, you can make this argument pretty easily just off of localization speed, probably. Ab absolutely. All right. Yeah. So what, what else we got? Oh, we've got the big breadwinner, which is specialization. Um, the D in data <laughs> for it's uh, it, you know it's pretty much the reason why you're going in this direction in the first place. Um, specialization uh, is critical uh, for making data work with your specific business needs. Um, you know, some people call it customization, some people call it modification, but all of these words you know, really, really should be avoided. Um, you know, you're pitching data to your executives uh, as an XML standard. And then you start talking about, hey, we can customize this standard. And suddenly you've got them all confused because, you know, the executives, they will understand standards. You know, there are many, many, many standards across all areas of business. And one thing that's usually consistent about standards is that if you break the standard, you no longer conform to the standard. So when you start talking about, hey, you know, the specialization thing allows us to modify or customize all of our content, you know, they're suddenly panicking saying, you know, you said that it was a standard, why are you changing it now? And, you know, 
in the in most cases, you know, they're not going to understand that, you know, it is something that you can change. So instead, you know, try approaching it from a different angle. You know, you can adapt data to meet your specific content requirements while remaining compliant with the data standard. And this will allow us to do our special thing while still benefiting from upgrades and from additional support and tweaks that happen to the data standard. We can still use the standard and be our own special little you know, thing over here. Uh, but the most critical message is that it doesn't, specialization does not break uh, your adherence to the standard. It actually adapts to the standard and adapts the standard to your specific business and content needs. You know, it's the key difference between customizing based on a standard and actually modifying or specializing, you know, the actual standard to adapt to a specific environment. Yeah, and I think this is a case of know your audience because some executives are going to be more concerned about having um, a content development environment that is an exact fit for what you're trying to do. And you know, specifically when you're dealing with compliance or engineering heavy organizations, there tends mm -hmm. to be this, our stuff is special and we have to get it exactly right. Um, and so in that case, you sell specialization, not as, hey, it's not scary and we'll stay in compliance with the standard, but as, hey, we can do exactly what we need to do for our content, but still be in compliance with a standard. So I think there you put the emphasis on the um, adaptability rather mm -hmm. than on the staying with the standard. Right. You're still special. You're not conforming to someone else's idea of how things should be done. Right. Uh, okay. We have another lovely word, which is modular. Um, <laughs> now, you might be able to get away with this if you have a sufficiently technical executive. Um, you know, this entire presentation should probably come with a disclaimer for uh, CTO founder types who tend to be pretty technical. Um, but, you know, in general, big execs, <laughs> big C level, um, no. So we love our modules, we love our chunks, we love our components, we think they're fantastic, and nobody else does, right? And you start talking about componentized content and you've lost them even if you somehow managed to avoid saying CCMS. <laughs> so the problem you run into with modular is people say we don't ship chunks, right? We ship documents or we have a website. And trying to convince them that your content should be managed, maintained, and stored in little bite-sized chunks uh, or little bite-sized modules, again, it's it's not what they're used to, and it can be a, a bit of a difficult sell. So here, we talk about building blocks. Um, again, if you have a software type executive, you can get pretty far talking about object-oriented content, which I guess goes against our rule of using jargon but on the other hand object oriented is so well understood in the software industry that you can you can do some cool stuff with that know your um, audience <laughs> yeah maybe this presentation should have been know your audience thank you for coming to our ted talk <laughs> um so object oriented and if you have uh products that are in fact component based or that customers can mix and match and build you can probably sell the idea of the content being similar. You know, the content also needs to be mix and match, build together and put it all together. And then you sort of go into this discussion of we manage chunks, right? But we ship the bigger pieces. Uh, nobody's arguing that, uh, you know, a car should be managed as, as, a, as a single thing on the assembly line. You're, you're putting it all together as it rolls down the assembly line. So eventually you have a bigger piece, but you start with bits and pieces, components, modules, whatever. So I think here it's helpful to translate this into um, more product oriented discussion because modular content for some reason just scares people. Um, so modules are, are problematic, but you can definitely talk about efficiency and reuse and you know that leads to ROI. So there we are back to the money argument, which that was the other the other half. Know your audience and focus on money. Those are those are the two things that you really have to have to look at. 
<laughs> yeah, and I like that car analogy, and I really hope that IKEA does not start selling cars. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so filtering. Um, you would think that filtering would be a pretty basic concept. You know, it's kind of a no-brainer uh, when you know we think about it. You know, you filter content. You have conditional content. We've been talking about conditionals in technical writing for well over 20 years. Um, but you start talking about variants, you start talking about these Didaval things, and um, you know things get a little little wonky. Uh, so if you start really explaining filtering or turning content on and off in a variety of combinations to get desired output, uh, you're back in the weeds. You know you're not at the level at which you know your executive really needs to understand things or wants to understand things. Um, you know you're down at the floor level is explaining how all the nuts and bolts work. And that's a big red flag. Um, and you're really inviting your executives to start thinking that, you know, oh, this data thing is really overly complicated for what we need. Um, do we really want to invest in this? So, you know, keep, you know, keep the discussions at a higher level. Filtering, you know, really is, um, you know, it's simple sounding, but once you start trying to explain it, you can go down a rabbit hole pretty quickly. So instead talk about the end result that you get from filtering. Um, don't talk about the action or how it works, uh, but focus on what you get. You know, so you're getting personalized content for people, you know, and that's really big if you're looking to, um, you know, produce, you know, custom built or slightly tweaked or modified, um, you know, products for your customers. You need that custom documentation to go with it. So having that personalization layer is there. Uh, if you have a variety of different products at different uh, with different feature sets, that's another great example to say, hey, we can provide customized content for you know for these various products, and we can manage it all in one place. You know, we can we can provide you know extremely tailored content to a particular audience. So when you start talking about, you know, is this a beginner level? Is this an intermediate level? Is this an expert level uh, bit of information? Who needs to understand this? You know, we don't want to publish everything out there and have the beginner trying to sift through all this advanced information. Um, and likewise, we don't want to overburden the expert users with having the, you know, extremely high level, you know, conceptual information and rudimentary step-by-step -step processes. They just need to get in, get an answer, and get out of the content. So being able to provide that as a tailored uh, aspect is important. But it's, it's, it's very important to focus on what you get out of the filtering uh, process and not talk about how it's done itself. I mean, everyone likes to be catered to. I mean, for, for over 40 years, Burger King's been saying, have it your way, um, and it's worked for them. And, you know, executives see the value of that personalization, you know, of that customization of being able to deliver something that is meaningful to a target audience. Um, just like having a product that's, you know, meaningful to a specific need that a customer has. Um, and they like it even better if it sounds easy to do. And, you know, again, here's a case where being able to deliver uh, customer specific information has enormous value. Uh, for, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, many of which have to do with, uh, you know, hiding features that you did specially for customer A from customer B, that type of thing. Um, I think it's also, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think it's also worth noting that uh, filtering, which we're not allowed to say, but <laughs> there's a way of doing personalization that does not require copies upon copies upon copies of the documents. Mm -hmm. Because in the you know non-dita content 1.0 world and and i'm not talking about the professional tools here but again just the here i am with a document and no special tools um customization very often involves make a copy yep. i mean and do a lot know, of rewrite a copy, rewrite it add the stuff for customer a try and keep track of this i mean i cannot tell you how many customers we have that have come to us and said we have to do personalization. We have to customize our documents. And right now we're maintaining 50 different copies. That's because... not an over-exaggeration either. <laughs> no, uh, it's, if anything, it's under, which is horrifying. And they, you know, and they can't keep track of them and they've lost track of the bits and pieces. And it's just a nightmare. So there's value here on the delivery side of 
delivering customized documentation or customized content or personalized information. There's also value on the development side because the pushback on customization in the early days was it's too expensive. I mean, it's not that you couldn't do it, it's that you had to make copies and it was terrible. So you can, I think, sell it from that point of view as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so so our seven, our seven ditto words that we've now been through are these. I, I suspect there are more. Um, what we're really saying is when you go talk to executives, focus on the business value to them, the value of the content to the organization, the increased value of the content to the organization when rendered, stored, managed in DITA, and don't overwhelm your sponsor with technical jargon that they do not want or need to understand. <laughs> um, I've seen this go sideways uh, you know, very badly in many, many meetings where you start digging into the the specifics and it just it just gets very ugly very fast because the takeaway for the executive is this sounds difficult and complicated yep yeah we don't want to go down this path because yeah it's too much of a risk yeah and and yeah it sounds risky i don't understand it therefore it's risky that's not an unreasonable position for someone to take because if I am unable to explain something to you, to you as a non-expert in this space, that means I don't understand it well enough to communicate with other people, you know, who are not just totally embedded in this, this nerd space. So that's kind of, you know, that's the thing. It's how do you, how do you adapt your messaging to get away from the jargon and to communicate to your sponsors, your funding people in ways that they will understand that will allow you to then get the funding that you need to move forward with the cool stuff that you want to do that revolves around, you know, specializing your content, putting it in a data CCMS, making everything modular, filtering it so that you have personalization and building a bunch of cool style sheets that rely on keys and conrefs. So with that, I think we are ready to take some questions. Yeah, yeah there actually, are Go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say I'd be interested to see if there are other terms out there that people have had, you know, either stumbling blocks or aren't sure how to relay certain bits of information to their executives. Um, certainly love to hear about those as well. And I don't know, maybe we can come up with some alternatives for you. In regard to the cost for localization, one person mentions that desktop publishing is about 50% of the cost of traditional localization. So that is a very compelling argument, kind of backing up what you said earlier. Yeah, it's the percentages vary based on the type of content that you have, and and again, you know what tools, you know the the, the traditional language, you know DTP was done in, but yeah, fifty percent is a good uh, good general rule of thumb. In regard to not saying specialization, one person mentioned the possibility of saying it is extensible in the sense that um, you can extend the standard without breaking it. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, it's extensible, adaptable, uh, even configurable. The, the one that's a little bit tricky is customizable because yes. when you say custom, it sounds like break the standard, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I did, but I do like extensible, yeah. What is an example of personalization when you're talking about filtering? Oh, that's a good one. Um, a very easy one is uh, training manuals. Let's put it that way. Um, so you have two different needs for like a live in-person class. You have the instructor guide and then you have the attendee guide or the student guide. And you need to make sure that the, uh, the instructor or the teacher's guide has everything that the student guide has so that they can follow along but has additional information built in, probably off to the side in the sidebar somewhere, uh, that guides the instructor through how to approach certain topics, uh, when to make certain transitions, what to show, um, you know, basically notes for, for how they're going to conduct their class. Uh, you don't want to have to write both of these versions of, this, of 
you know, this training guide separately and then have to update two different copies every time, you know, a procedure changes or, you know, a concept changes or gets removed or added. Um, you want to be able to do it in one place and then have, you know, an additional uh, rule that says when I'm publishing for the instructor, include all this other stuff. And when I'm publishing for the student, take that stuff out. Yeah, right, I think we could even take that further to, you know, the grizzled veteran instructor gets less than the newbie instructor. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, the newbie instructor gets everything, and the grizzled veteran gets like four bullet points. <laughs> yeah, and the case study yesterday from Barbara Green of ACS Technologies. ACS does uh, provides um, services and software for churches and different denominations have different terms for you know some of the same things. By using the structured content and data, they're able to provide that information with specific terminology for the different denominations. So one denomination doesn't have to see the terminology of another. So there are lots of very you know granular real world ways that you can customize that content. Yeah, and that is such a good example because people tend to take it really, really personally when you don't use the proper terminology for their, uh, uh, you know, their religious terms. <laughs> that could right. end very badly. Right. <laughs> what do you think about avoiding the word data entirely or using something like structured content instead? Huh. I think that's, that's a good starting point, but eventually you have to reveal what you're using. Uh, otherwise, you know, someone else with a different plan or a different uh, group in the in the company might have a different form of structured content that they're trying to use, and they're like, "Hey, why don't we just marry up everybody under our you know uh, our umbrella instead of your umbrella?" Um, and if the executive doesn't realize there's a difference between you know whose <laughs> whose structure is what. Um, but it's also important to talk about data separately as well. Um, just be careful about the terms you use because it is, um, you know, it is extensible. It is, you know, you do have that specialization uh, aspect that you're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> um, it, it's an interesting, yeah, it's an it, interesting it's question. question. Go ahead. Because, sorry, go ahead. Nope, don't nope, go right ahead. Well, for us, everybody on this call, the word data has has meaning, right? We know what it is. It's XML, it has this, it has that. You know, even if you're here as a beginner, you kind of know what data is, or you sat through the intro to data and you know you have some idea. But if you go to an executive and you start using the word data and they've never heard of it, then there's nothing there for them. It doesn't convey any meaning. So I think that you have the right answer in thinking about talking about structured content generally. Um, to Bill's point, you have to actually define what structured content is to stay out of trouble. And what we typically focus on is the ability to uh, define required structure for your content and then enforce that structure through the software. Um, we can then sort of leapfrog into, and there's a standard that provides for this, which is flexible and extensible and blah, blah, and that's DITA. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense to lead with structured content or lead with, um, we've tried things like modern content or smart content or you know all these kinds of things. But, but I think the key point is that invoking DITA is magical for the people that know what data is, and it doesn't work at all for the people that haven't ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. And I believe, Sarah, was it you that wrote a white paper or blog post on XML for executives? Um, yes, <laughs> I think I did. I think you did. Um, oh dear. And we can go look that up, but we do have, we also have a white paper on structure authoring and XML that takes a more generic look at that. And that could also be, that could play into this to kind of build up the level, start with the generic stuff and then get to the specifics that we are going to use this particular standard, the DITA standard. Uh, another question, how would you talk about purchases required for a move into DITA, authoring tool, 
CCMS connectors to a learning management system, a content management system, a translation management system, et cetera. <laughs> you don't start with, I need a special thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Even though you totally need a special thing. Absolutely. Um, you know, again, you have to kind of start with, um, you know, you start with the business problems that you have and you start with the business goals and you try to bridge that gap between the problems you have now, the goals that you're trying to reach, and you start poising the capabilities of these types of systems that fill that gap. Uh, that's really where you start. And then when you have their attention, uh, you can then start getting a little bit deeper into the specific features that will allow you to, um, you know, really realize um, the return on investment in those purchases. Uh, what do you think, Sarah? I find it, yes, and, um, because I think you're, you're right. You start with the business, right? You start with the business goals, the business problem, the need. Um, once you get past that, it can be helpful to talk about the content life cycle. How mm -hmm. do you author content? How do you manage it? How do you uh, delete it when it's done, right? That's the governance issue. How do you translate? How do you localize? And you end up building up this uh, vision or, I mean, really it's a system architecture, right? That shows how all those pieces and parts go together and how they flow. Um, it can also be really, really helpful to show the before picture. How does the content flow right now? Where half of your arrows are like copy and paste, or they're going around in circles because the reviews go in circles, and then, oh, a copy gets made over here, and then we have version 2.1.5 final, and 2.1.5.6 final, final, that kind of thing. Um, it can be very enlightening to show not just here's the system or the collection of systems that we need, but here's what we're doing right now, even if you don't have a system, because almost certainly it's going to be this unbelievable spaghetti diagram. <laughs> That's true. So how do you address that writers will not be using Microsoft Word anymore? Well, why is it important that they use Microsoft Word in the first place? Is, I guess, my first question. But, you know, ideally, um, unless... Unless you have a, you know, a really uh, attentive bean counter asking that question to say, hey, we get Microsoft Office with every computer we buy. Um, you know, why can't they just use Microsoft Word? Um, I'd put it back to say, you know, it costs them, you know, 10 times the effort to do in Word what they can do with something more efficient. Uh, and time is money. Uh, you know, I mean, when you when you're talking, you know, hours, you know, if you can translate down something that takes a day to do in Word uh, down to an hour or less uh, in something else, um, you know, that not only saves you, you know, seven hours of time, but it also allows you to spend that seven hours of time doing something else more productive and it compounds. Um, but in general, I mean. I, I, I've not met an executive that is hung up on dictating that people use tools like Microsoft Word. A lot of times it's, it, it, you know, that type of mentality of why can't they just use this usually comes from a misunderstanding or just, you know, they just don't know what goes into um, putting content out there, you know, and they don't understand the content life cycle and, you know, maybe they don't want to. Um, but again, you have to bring it back to, um, you know, the return on investment and say, look, this is the expenditure of doing it the way we're doing it now. And this is the return on, you know, yes, there's an investment to changing, but this is what we get, you know, on the, on the output side, you know, when we change the way we work, this is the additional stuff that we can do for the company. This is how much faster we can do things for the company. This is, you know, how much money we're saving on translation costs, you know, when we do it a different way. Um, so having those discussions is more important than immediately jumping down a, you know, my tool's better than this tool uh, approach, because that's just not going to work. And the mindset there that are, you... Go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry. There, there are um, DITA authoring tools that can be embedded into Microsoft Word. So it is in fact not actually an either or discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that is an option to look at. 
in addition to the efficiency, I mean, I think the key here really is just to say, because, you know, we're talking about just generic word. Why can't I just, you know, flail in a word file and produce stuff? And the answer is that we are trying to produce content that is more valuable to the organization. And we can't do that with a bunch of people flailing around in word with normal styles. Yep. Yeah, and if the argument is around, well, you can't share, you know, this special XML content with the rest of the company and have them be able to provide feedback and all that stuff. Uh, if you missed it, I would go back and look for the recording for Radu's presentation that uh, happened just before this one. Um, because there are tools out there that, um, you know, allow you to have a light web interface for people to add comments, to be able to lightly edit text or even just suggest edits. And a lot of times they work very similar to, uh, for example, Google Drive, you know, or Google, uh, Google Docs, you know, being able to add comments, uh, make suggested changes. Um, so just because you're moving in a direction that is, you know, <sighs> highly custom compared to Microsoft Word, which is rather ubiquitous, um, you still have the ability to put your content out there for, for a wide swath of review, you know, if you need to, without really, you know, adding, you know, a ton more uh, overhead into training people how to use these, you know, the, this new tool, you know, just to comply with an XML standard. In regard to the mindset and reasons for using Microsoft Word, one attendee says, "I only reason I use it is because my customers do." Yeah, that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, Carry on. <laughs> if you if you need to provide what you produce in a format that someone else is going to use, yes, you could do it in XML and then export out to RTF and then open that in Word. Um, but why? Would you, especially if there's a lot of round robin, because then you're stuck in a situation where you need to then consume the Word document back into XML in order to produce Word again. You know, so you're adding a layer of complexity that, you know, in that specific situation just doesn't need to be there. We have built round tripping workflows to address that issue. Um, but that only only makes sense if you both really need XML data and mm -hmm. also have a requirement to have your authors working in Word. Um, and specifically, the example I'm thinking of is a case where the people providing the content, writing the content, were world experts on the topic and volunteers. Yes. That's a case where you actually can't impose a workflow on them. You need to just take what you can get and say, thank you very much, uh, expert person. And then they took that and marked it up by hand to convert it into data and then eventually actually round tripped it back for updates. But the reason they did that in that specific scenario was because they needed the value that the data markup provided on the delivery side and had no ability to force the content contributors. Oh, they were also part time. Uh, they had no and scattered around the world. They had no ability to force those content <laughs> contributors into a database workflow. Yeah, when when you're getting expertise um, out of the kindness of someone's heart uh, who isn't being paid to produce that content, you generally have to let them work the way they need to work in order to get that info. I have a question in regard to translation. Why do you claim data reduces translation costs? The translation software has had reuse features, translation memory, for example, for more than two decades. So uh, the reuse is already being handled there. Um, well, that's not true. Um, translation memory software uh, has matching and fuzzy matching and all that fun stuff. But in the end, it relies on the author being consistent throughout the documentation. So if you have someone working in Word um, and the translation memory is expecting phrasing to read one way and it's slightly different, there's a cost incurred there. If for whatever reason you went through and broke up a paragraph into two separate chunks, there may be a translation impact there. It might be a minimal cost for someone to go in and reproofread. Uh, what you've done, but uh, there is a cost there. Um, 
so it's not exactly reuse it's just leveraging what it knows it translated before and tries to look for that phrasing again and say oh i know what this is i'm going to fill it in automatically the real savings from DITA from a localization perspective is um, it's on removing that formatting layer, removing the desktop publishing need uh, on the localization side of things. And the other um, slightly less profitable, but, but just as important is the reuse that you get from DITA. Uh, being able to write something once and use it in, you know, five, 10, 20, 100 different places by reference. That way that string only ever gets translated once. So it doesn't matter if you have a fuzzy match in that string, you only have one fuzzy match, not five, 10, 20, 100 fuzzy matches. And that reduces your cost as well. We are gonna drop in a link to the survey for evaluating this session. Please fill that out when you see that. And we're gonna wrap up with a comment, and I think it's a pretty good one, in regard to gathering business requirements. This attendee says, I find it helpful to ask, if today was the first day of business, what would we, what would we be doing? And that would represent the future state. And then you talk about the current state and what's going on and what you have to do to get from the current state to that future state. That's really a good way of simplifying it. It's not even for, for an executive discussion, but sometimes even a discussion among your own team to be able to say, look, if we were going to do this, you know, and forget how we're doing it now, but if we were going to do X, how would we do it? And then you take a look, you know, as they said, take a look at how you're doing it now. That's a real easy way to get people who are on the fence about switching to XML, getting them on board uh, a different solution, a different path. Um, and yeah, it's a difficult conversation to have, I guess, with, you know, with team members, you know, executives aside, because there's comfort in the way that you're currently working, but sometimes seeing that end goal and getting your mind out of the, this is how I do it today, kind of helps, um, kind of frame that that entire discussion and with that I think we're going to wrap up 